So you sort of think on. Do I need, do I need a mic or we? No, that's it right okay. there. Good. And I'm on YouTube too now, see? Oh, cool. So that makes it kind of nice, see? Yeah. So you put that on your little note, you know, yeah. notepad, and send it out to I'll the world. I'll put it in my yeah, send electronic it out to the world. Yeah, yeah, send it out to the world. See? Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Welcome again to this segment of the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host. Folks, we're going to get right down to business. Uh, as you know, there are many issues that we're, been, that we're looking at at this point in time, folks, from a national standpoint, from a state standpoint, and respective cities in all states around, this, uh, around our nation, if you will. And so what we want to do is that we're going to sort of give you an update uh, uh, from the state of Oregon standpoint as to uh, what's going on in the state of Oregon? Where we where we've been? Where we where we are today? Where we're going? And uh, and all, then bring it down to maybe the largest city, if you will, in the state of Oregon. That's the city of Portland, and it has and it has the largest, if you will, blue collar uh, environment here within the state of Oregon. And and uh, and when you start thinking about those, how do who do you pick? How do you get to, uh, get someone to to be able to respond across that board? Because we're going to be talking primarily of the legislature, because those basically the government of the people, by the people, and for the people. These are the folks you've elected to office. These are the people that know what the issues are in your respective community. And then you got to bring it back to the table. And hopefully you can excite someone so you can take the bacon back home. <laughs> you got me? So the bottom line is that I thought maybe in the past we had Rod Monroe. Rod was on, and, and he basically gave us sort of an overview of what the legislature is and what the issues were and whatever. And so this time around, we're going to start a whole new day. And a, a, a dear friend of mine, a guy who's been, in all due respect, I've got to give a lot of respect and kudos to this gentleman. Because in all due respect, whenever you start thinking about the whole issue of gang issues and the unemployment and, and i.e., the whole the itch of education and this, that, and the other, uh, Senator Shields has been very much involved. In fact, uh, uh, here's a guy, and, and I'll just say it straight up to, to him, and even though he's sitting right here, is that he could have actually gone out and made a lot of money. But he opted to basically say, I want to identify what an issue in this area that's constantly being beat up and this, that, and the other, round and round and on. And that, I, e, that was, those are basically folks that are caught in the criminal justice system. And you've heard this on and on and on and on, even in the state from a national perspective. When you go to an urban area, African Americans are definitely totally misrepresented from the standpoint of uh, the number of incarcerated in the criminal justice system. And not just African Americans, but across the board, many of the folks who are, who are involved in this process. That's a tough, tough job. And what I mean by that is that how do you go about, uh, how do you go about once a person gets in that criminal justice system, uh, they've done their time, and now they want to come back and be a part of their families, and get a job, and this, that, and the other. And in all due respect, you got this other person over here who didn't commit a crime. <laughs> And they're looking for a job also, too. But it takes a major commitment, if you will, to get in and get involved with those folks and develop the enthusiasm to get them motivated, if you will, to get out and, uh, and, and be a part of the community. And, 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 and that's a very, it's a very tough note. So I want, I want you to know that um, I remember when he put together Better People before he even got uh, involved in even the politics of this business, if all the, i.e. the legislature, whatever. And I remember going to some of those sessions and, and, uh, and the things that he was doing with that program in terms of getting the families together and, and really spending a lot of time to try to get these people back into the community and this, that, and the other. It's a tough, tough situation. So I want to take my hat off to him. And I wanted to say that, uh, you know, now that all of a sudden he's gotten involved in politics. He's got a lot of things on his plate. Uh, at this point in time, besides just the area that he has to represent, he's got state issues, too, because he's got to review their issues in respective areas around the state. So I can go on and on and on about this guy, but I want you just to just let, let's, see, let's see what we can do. We're going to go uh, from, quote, the state. In fact, we might even talk a little bit about national stuff, because I noticed his name was on the, the, the so-called, uh, this whole business about the shootings and whatever. I think uh, several people in the district, besides yourself, had uh, talked about the whole issue with the... Uh, uh, the assault weapon thing. Or something. You guys have made an announcement they aren't going in or whatever. So we're going to do this, the, the national deal. We're going to do the state deal. We're gonna, then we're going to come down the second half hour and talk about the respective issues here within his particular district. Okay? So with that, I'm going to introduce 
Senator Shields, how you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, man. Bruce. Fine. You know, we were just talking small time. You understand? What about the What about that new one on to, to your to your life, dear? Oh yeah, uh, I've got a uh, young daughter, four and a half years old, and uh, she's the joy of my life. Oh, I bet that's a lot of fun. Yeah. A lot okay, of fun. good. <laughs> okay, good. Well, Chip, welcome him again. Seriously, welcome. And and I and I'm, I'm really seriously saying the fact that you've opted to quote really represent a community that is, as you know, you've seen a lot of things in that, that this, this particular community. But you didn't just, quote, leave after the represent, after you got the representative seat. You went on to be to become senator at this point in time. And so I want to thank you, and I'm sure that many of, of the folks who have supported you in the past uh, would, would like to thank you also, too, for, for taking up, if you will, the baton, because now Margaret is gone. And, um, and the fact of it is that there's a lot of issues in the community, education, and on and on and on. And so, I, again, I take my hat off to you, and, and this is coming also from the people. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you. Okay, good. So, look, what I did, I, we sort of put together some questions. I put together some questions so we can really get down to the meat of the matter sure. here. And I'll just go right down the line, and you just go it on and say every so often when, okay. I, when I don't understand something, I'll ask <laughs> you the question, okay? So what, what are your priorities of, of this legislative session? What do you think? Well, I think the first thing I'd like to, to mention is something that you talked about, is that it's an incredible challenge to fill the very big shoes of Margaret Carter, yes. who has done so much in this community. Um, and I'm doing my best in, in touch with her and trying to, uh, to learn the ropes on the Senate side as well as I possibly can. Uh, the, the four things that I generally work on each legislative session are living wage jobs, health care, schools and equality. Mm -hmm. Living wage jobs, health care, schools and equality. And one of the things that I'm really, really troubled with in North and Northeast Portland is that Oregon, like the rest of the country, is hurting and unemployment is just way too mm -hmm. high, particularly for working class people where uh, so many jobs have been shipped overseas. So a big focus that I'm going to have in the next legislative session is trying to put people back to work. Towards that end, I've been working with Portland Community College, with Vigor Industrial on Swan Island to help create a welder boot camp mm -hmm. on Swan Island mm -hmm. that could put a lot of people to work in living wage jobs. Um, what we found by having a number of living wage jobs town halls over the last uh, couple of years is that there are a number of living wage jobs in manufacturing mm -hmm. on Swan Island, in Rivergate, companies that are dying for people to just show up on time every day, clean mm -hmm. and sober with a little bit of skill, and they'll hire them. And, uh, Places like Vigor have been in a position where they're actually having to import people from Mississippi, put them up at a really? hotel for months on end, when we could easily train people uh, with just a little bit more uh, innovation and a little bit more resources. So. I'm keeping my fingers crossed. Um, it's going to be a tough um, environmental or budget environment, but I'm hopeful that we can end up uh, getting more welders uh, going on Swan Island. What, what, what would be work. the makeup of that group, if you will? Would community college be involved in this piece? To yeah, what, what I'm hoping, it, PCC would okay. would be running at PCC Cascade on Swan Island. They just, um, they've just expanded down there. Then I would hope that community-based organizations like Better People, like this uh, Margaret Carter Skills Center, mm -hmm. would feed in uh, and be a source for those people as well as just every everyday people from the community. Is, is it ready for applicants at this point in time or are you going to be making the announcement at some time? Well, um, Vigor Industrial is actually, uh, they have uh, a welder training program now. Basically what we want to do is to expand it. So okay. uh, people can call the PCC Workforce Center okay. on 42nd. Mm -hmm. They can call the Margaret Carter Skills Center uh, to try to get into some of those Vigor Industrial slots today. We're okay. hoping to expand it so a lot more people will be able to be served tomorrow. And it really is an opportunity too also to pick up a couple of bucks if you if you're going on the register, you know, as a community college, because there are grants that are being given out, right? Pell grants and things That's like that. That's right. Nature. And I think uh, through this particular funding stream I'm not even sure there'll be a cost. Is that right? Yeah. Oh wow. They run up there and get those jobs. Give them a call. I'd also like to give some uh, some kudos to Work Systems Incorporated. They're okay. also a key partner in this. Okay, good, good. All right, next thing. Now, it seems health insurance is getting more and more expensive, and a lot of people can't afford it, afford the care. Can you tell us what you're doing to make health insurance companies justify their big premium increases? Yeah. Um the governor's office has been doing some monumental work on transforming health care and how it's delivered. But uh, I've taken a, a slice of that and looked at uh, how the private insurance market has been working. Uh, I chair uh, 
a committee that's called the General Government Consumer and Small Business Protection Committee, the General Government Consumer and Small Business Protection Committee. And on that small business protection side, we've been looking at how health insurance companies uh, have been increasing premiums, particularly on people in the small group market and the individual market. Hmm. A lot of people don't know this, but Oregon has an insurance commissioner. And part of the insurance commissioner's job is to approve, disapprove, or modify health insurance premium increase requests. And they're almost always increase requests, not decrease requests, in the individual and small group markets. Individuals, just like it sounds, you're out there swinging on your own mm -hmm. trying to get health insurance. Small group is two to 50 employees. Now, the reason that's important for Portland is that 94% of all Portland businesses are within those parameters, 50 employees or less. So we took a look at what other insurance commissioners are doing around the country and took a look at what our insurance commissioner uh, had been doing. And what we found is that states that have a very robust public process mm -hmm. to health insurance rate review tended to be able to keep health insurance premiums lower than those that didn't have a public process. And a lot of the testimony that we heard had some very concerning and, and disturbing things about how Oregon was doing it. I'm not suggesting that there was anything illegal or unethical, but we didn't have the structure. And so we heard testimony about backroom deals and backroom meetings between CEOs of insurance companies and the insurance commissioner when there was a rate filing in front of them. and. Um, and it just looked very, very bad. So what we've done is we pushed for two things. One, that there would be a public hearing associated with every health insurance premium increase request in the individual and small group markets. And two, that there would be a second set of eyes taking a look mm -hmm. at the filings because they're very complicated. You need an actuary, accountants, lawyers, et cetera, so that uh, we could come to uh, a reasonable conclusion of whether or not they were reasonable. The good news for everyday people is what we found is that faced with greater scrutiny, health insurance companies are seeking smaller premium increase requests than they have in the past. Mm -hmm. And I think that's because, you know, these double digit premium increases frankly just didn't mm -hmm. add up. Medical utilization is at some of its lowest uh, in, in over a decade. Medical inflation is a lot lower than, than the insurance industry will tell you. So faced with greater scrutiny, places like LifeWise, which were asking for 13% increases in 2010, actually asked for a decrease in, uh, in 2011, 2012. So that's real money in the, in the pocket of small business. And I think as we go through you know, uh, Obamacare and the Affordable mm -hmm. Care Act, a really strong health insurance rate review process is going to be critical. Mm -hmm. You know, you make a good point, too, on that particular point, because my wife is a small business person. And uh, we're looking constantly looking to hire folks, but it's like all start uh -huh. You know, it's a tough thing because you're constantly putting monies out and you're looking at about a five year turnaround before you maybe even looking at in the black. Right. And so so naturally that's pushed that that date up, if you will, maybe six, maybe seven years if you make it. Uh -huh. You got me. And most of the folks out there, they need the care. I mean, a lot of times, a lot of them are senior, senior, you know, senior parents, if you will. I mean, single parents, if you will. I mean, and uh, and so they need, uh, they got kids and things of that nature, and they need that insurance, especially a female. Mm -hmm. you, know, you have one or two or three kids and whatever, mm -hmm. and so consequently, on the small business plan, well, gee, I just can't. I mean, I can, I can go maybe eleven, but if I get to get fifteen bucks an hour just to start, right. if you will, and commit, that's tough to do, yeah. especially startups. And we got a lot of startups here. We got cards. Mm -hmm. We got all kinds of things. So, so the point that you're making. And the, and the focus in that area, we really appreciate that. Yeah, thanks. Okay, good, good. Okay, some people might not know this, but the, the, the Attorney General is prohibiting from suing insurance companies who engage in fraud. Are you working on that, too, as part of that? Yeah, um, yeah I think you hit that right on the head. Um, a lot of people don't know that the Oregon Attorney General is prohibited from suing insurance companies that engage in fraud. Um, insurance is the only line of business the only line of business that is exempt from the state's Unfair Trade Practices Act. How long has it been? Uh, it's been in effect for as long as I, as long as I can remember. Wow. So um, it, there used to be two lines of business that were exempt: banks, 
and insurance companies mm -hmm. were the only lines of business that were exempt from the state's Unfair Trade Practices Act. I'm happy to report that we uh, removed that exemption in the legislature in 2010 against uh, incredible pressure from the banking lobby. Um, now the next task is to make sure that insurance companies that engage in fraud are able to, uh, to be sued by the Attorney General and also had to have uh, uh, the individual to have a private right of action. That's something that we'll be working on in the next session. And this is important not only for consumers, but what we've also heard in my committee is that um, small business in particular is having a difficult time in Oregon when they uh, are trying to, in, in good faith, get a claim paid by an mm -hmm. insurance company mm -hmm. and that just across the river in Washington it's much more favorable and easier for small business to get an insurance company to, to play fair with them. So those are the kinds of issues that we're looking at in the small business protection side of my committee and the consumer protection side of my committee and uh, because we just basically feel that insurance companies should have to pay claims mm -hmm. fairly, they should have to pay reimbursements fairly. You think the legislature might go on and pick that up and pass it? I, uh, I <laughs> the last time when we tr we tried to get this through in the previous session, we were uh, a colleague of mine um, were looking through the the lobby book of how many lobbyists were hired to try to kill this bill. We came up with 43 lobbyists that we knew of that were trying to kill this bill. But I think at the end of the day, people understand that insurance shouldn't get special treatment. It shouldn't be exempt from the Unfair Trade Practices Act. Th that it doesn't make sense. Uh, people should be should. I think they are uh, appalled when they find out the attorney general cannot sue insurance companies that engage in fraud. And so I think uh, the people are there and hopefully the leaders will follow. Mm -hmm. You know, I might, I might add too that uh, that was one of the reasons why I wanted to ask you that particular question because a number of because I'm, I'm constantly talking to other small businesses when I go and shop and things of that nature, and uh, a number of them are looking kind of like uh, uh, just as a I can't afford this package, but I might be able to pick up this package for maybe about ten bucks a month or so, and I might be able to motivate a person, i.e., if you get sick or something that nature, I can claim. But then a lot of them are saying, Bruce, I picked up the I picked up the policy, but guess what? They, they, they wouldn't pay us. Right. And then all of a sudden, I had to, one, I had to stop. I was paying. He said, I was paying for the deal. And then the next thing, I had to stop. And then actually, the other person was very upset, and he blamed me, if you will, yeah. and it caused some ill feelings and whatever. So I've lost an employee, and I lost my money. Yeah. So the point that that's, that's why I wanted to raise this particular question, because we're anxious to know where is it going to be. And anything you can, anything, any, any help you want along that particular line, please give us a call. Yeah. Small business folks, okay? Well, <laughs> right, thank you. I could use all the help I can get. Well, hey, we'll I, be more glad to come up and testify. Yeah, and I, I am cautiously optimistic. I think that, um, you know, the table is set pretty well on mm -hmm. this, and I'm hopeful that um, the insurance lobby will um, take a look at what's in their best interest and mm -hmm. say, look, w this is probably going to pass, so we should probably sit down and try to negotiate mm -hmm. something that works for everybody. Mm -hmm. And then, and then uh, you know, from their standpoint, hey, tighten up the app a little bit if you want to. Tighten up the application and make sure you, you explain to them exactly what the policy is going to do. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing about it. It was just so open. They just ran for it. And then all of a sudden, you, you never know if you're hiring a person, then they, they might do something intentionally or just on the other side of the deal. Got me? But the fact is this would really help yep. by the way okay so anything you can do just let us know okay okay uh, Oregon has a as an over representation of minorities in prison and that's been said many times over and I know you've got to be aware of it because you've been involved in that process for quite some time trying to resolve some of those issues when you were in private practice so mm -hmm. to speak yeah. what are your thoughts on how to address that whole this whole issue today I'm glad you asked. Well, it, as you know, uh, just about five blocks up the street, I started an outfit called Better People. Exactly. It's a uh, living wage employment and counseling program for people who are in recovery from addiction, right. people who've been in trouble with the law. And uh, we uh, had some good results uh, in reducing recidivism, the rate at which offenders return to crime. And we decided um, uh, Ms. Clarina Boston, who was one of my co-founders and now the executive director, uh, that we wanted to put it in this neighborhood because of the dramatic overrepresentation of African Americans, particularly in the criminal justice system. It's a huge problem in Oregon. It's a huge problem around the country. So one of the bills that I've been working on now, this will be the third session I've been trying to get it passed, and I, I think we're at a at a place where we can do it, is to 
model off of what's been successful in Iowa, mm -hmm. Minnesota, and Connecticut, and uh, is, is moving across the country, which is to create racial impact statement legislation, racial impact mm -hmm. statement legislation. So, and it works simply like this. When we are passing a bill, we get a fiscal impact statement. Mm -hmm. How much is it going to cost? Mm -hmm. uh, some states have an environmental impact statement associated with certain legislation that could talk about what the environmental mm -hmm. impacts are. And in things related to sentencing, child welfare, this legislation would say, okay, if we pass this, what is going to be the likely impact on people of color and, um, and other um, you know, protected groups? So what all this does is say, okay, and, and, and the classic example is at the federal level, the difference between crack cocaine sentencing and powder cocaine. Mm -hmm. You can look at the bill, and a lot of times you can do this in the legislature and say, okay, I can look at this sentence enhancement and tell you who it's most likely to affect. This bill would simply uh, put the charge to the Criminal Justice Commission when a legislator asks for it to write a racial impact statement with the notion being that if we agree that minority overrepresentation is important, the first thing we should do is not make it worse. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we can go in eyes wide open. We can still pass the bill if it says there's going to be uh, uh, you know, minority uh, or racial impact that could be significant. We can still pass it if the public interest warrants right. it. But it might give us the chance to hit the pause button and say, okay, rather than increasing sentences for people who are considered um, part of a criminal street gang uh, by ad just adding two years onto their sentence based on affiliation. Maybe there's another way we can get at that problem. Instead of paying uh, $3 million in added prison costs, maybe we could take $3 million and fund the Multnomah County, uh, East Multnomah County Gang Task Force and put police officers in hot spots all throughout the county and, and get to the public safety issue that way. Because I think that um, we're, we're coming to learn that uh, there's more to public safety than just building more and more prisons. Mm -hmm. It's more, public safety is also about legal services, it's about domestic violence services, it's about uh, state troopers on our streets, it's about uh, drug and alcohol treatment, it's about Head Start. And when, uh, when somebody comes forward with a sentencing bill, we really need to look at the big picture of what mm -hmm. is actually going to be accomplished here. You know, you make a good point along that line because and then one of the big issues from a national perspective now, they're talking about entitlements. And it sort of falls in that same thing. The people want to know basically, okay, fine, if we appropriate these funds, if you will, is there a light at the end of the tunnel? You know, what are the benefits? Mm -hmm. And then maybe, uh, 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 maybe coming back periodically, kind of like auditing it, so to speak, and kind of letting the public know, okay, we started this piece, and this is what it was a success at this mm -hmm. point in time. Or if not that, it wasn't success. We're going to kind of change it around a bit and and maybe do it go this way, just like you're talking about at this point in time. But people are very concerned about that particular issue. But I, I like that, that what you're just saying, but again, we need to just educate the public a little bit more, just like you're doing. That's why we asked the question. Yeah, that's right. I, I think that um, we do need to, to, you know, as much as people might not like to hear it, the yeah. budget really is a fixed pot. Yes. If, you're, if you're giving to one thing, you're taking from <laughs> something exactly. else. And what we've seen over the last 20 years is that we're now spending more on our prison system. Mm -hmm. When you look at our youth correctional system and our adult correctional system, we're spending more on our prison system than we are on higher education and community colleges combined more on prisons and higher ed and community colleges combined, almost $1.4 billion. And we're spending about $440 or million dollars on community colleges. Mm -hmm. So um, we're never going to be able to pull ourselves out of this great recession right. with those kinds of spending priorities. Right, right. So, you know, and if I were to ask you, because, uh, you know, you've been there before. Like you said, that's how, that's how you got involved in where you are today. You've, in fact, as far as I'm concerned, you've got more knowledge about what should be done, hmm. as Thanks. opposed to individuals outside of the realm. And then that's basically what the problem is. So you've got quite a task. they are having to go before this, well, 99% of the body, mm -hmm. trying to educate them about what is really going on here in this particular area, right. Right? I mean, yeah. as opposed to just a racial kind of a deal. And that's a tough sell, right? That's a very tough sell. Can you, can you compare that with better people from the standpoint of, could you just share with the, share with the viewing audience, you know, in terms of you started the program and you, you have some ideas of what your successes were and mm -hmm. whatever, you know, just give them some, some examples. If sure. You know. um, 
Well, you know, a lot of people are under the impression that if you just give somebody a job, give them housing, that the rest of their life will will fall into place right. if they've been in trouble with the law. That the literature doesn't really show that. Mm -hmm. That you need to have something that helps people who you know are in recovery from addiction. They've got issues and mm -hmm. they've got to deal with mm -hmm. them. They've got to come to grips with how they do business and how they get through life. So we coupled our living wage job. Uh, placement program with what psychologists call a cognitive behavioral therapy. It's mm -hmm. essentially changing the way one thinks mm -hmm. in order to help change the way one behaves. Mm -hmm. And that's been shown to be successful. What we also know in the literature is that there's a sweet spot where incarceration does good, you know, incapacitates offenders and keeps them off the street. Mm -hmm. But there's also a diminishing return that if you take somebody that has a lot of pro-social ties, mm -hmm. has a job, maybe is married, um, you know, has you know strong pro-social ties to the community, and you lock that person away for an extended period of time, mm -hmm. then those pro-social ties disappear and mm -hmm. they come out and they've got nothing. So I think the the first thing we got to do is make sure that we don't make crime worse. Mm -hmm. And um, one thing that I've learned in the legislature is um, that. Uh, you sell people what they want now. You sell people what they need later. <laughs> and uh, I got you. Okay. I, I, I like that. You know, I, I went. I, I charged into the legislature and, and was, um, and particularly when when my party was in the minority, there were a lot of tough on crime bills coming through, yeah. and you got Came thrown into a situation there. where you just you had to vote no on them, and you had to stand up and tell people why. Um, so I, I've, I had become a bit of a lightning rod on this issue because I've talked about it a lot. Some people would say incessantly. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I decided to take a step back and uh, let the governor's taken a, a much stronger role in this. Uh, Senator Przanski from Eugene, uh, Representative Barker, uh, Representative Olson. I think that um, groups like the District Attorneys Association have opened up a little bit because mm -hmm. I've taken a step back and, and there, there hasn't been kind of the immediate resistance mm -hmm. to uh, to some of the ideas that mm -hmm. I had. So I think um, that's one of the things that I've learned in the legislature. Sometimes less is more. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. if you change the picture, sometimes you can change the outcome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I thought this came to mind with what you just said, and you're right. Uh, and then I, as a fact, I make the point about the fact that you are right here. You know, you're seeing it every day, day in and day out, and you've gone through all of the interviews with folks and kind of getting a sense of where they're coming from, et cetera, et cetera, talking to families and the whole nine yards. But again, the outside world, and the majority of the folks on the other side are not, they're not aware of that situation. Mm -hmm. And, and, I, and I, the person that comes to mind is Kevin, Kevin Mannix. You know, he's, a, he's an activist in his own right, if mm -hmm. you will. And he, once he gets something in his mind, he just goes that way. But I'm just, but so I'll ask the question, has he ever given you a call and said, let's have a cup of coffee and, and sit down and chat about uh, we, we have. We've sat down in my office Kevin? and we've, uh, we've, we've hashed through um, you know, so you have talked ideas. about it, right? Okay. We have talked, yeah. And I think, you know... And what about public forums? You know, for instance, like, let's say, for instance, if we were to arrange something, let's say arrange something within this this particular district, this senatorial district, mm -hmm. in the city of Portland, and have a, i.e., a conference on, on, on the issue. I'd be happy to come. Something? Okay. I, I, he you actually, to his credit, he, he, he came to a better people forum. He's that kind of a guy. Um, and, you know, just because, uh, you know, you have a difference of opinion with somebody doesn't mean right. that right. Uh, that you can't talk to right. him. In fact, going back to what I was talking about on the insurance issues, we never would have gotten the uh, the public hearings on health insurance rate review uh, or the second set of eyes um, on health insurance rate review, really making insurance companies justify their premiums, mm -hmm. had it not been for Representative Mike McLean, the Republican who was my wing person in the negotiations okay. from Prineville. Um, I, I have the world of respect for him, very mm -hmm. smart guy. actually used to live in Northeast Portland, hmm. uh, graduated from Lewis and Clark Law School and worked for Stoll Rees for a few years. So, so he understands uh, Northeast Portland a little yes, bit, and right. then went back home to be a country lawyer yeah. in uh, in Prineville, and um, really um, really understood how important this was for small business. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think you're you're right on track. Again, like you said, is that we just to make we got to make sure we educate and inform the public. Now mm -hmm. we have to now because it's, I mean that buck is getting to the point; it's getting so small, yeah. and the fact the kind of dollars we're spending in the criminal justice system is ridiculous. Almost. Yeah. It's a tough situation. Another um, colleague that I worked with very closely, that I was 
was uh, Representative, form, now former Representative Patrick Sheehan, mm -hmm. who represented uh, Clackamas County. Um, Oregon spends millions and millions of dollars to put people to death. And we only really put people to death when they volunteer to be put to death mm -hmm. through stopping mm -hmm. their appeals. So um, I sat down with Representative Sheehan. He said, you know, this is crazy. It costs way too much money. We're not executing anybody. And if really what we're trying to do is make the world safer, we can do that with mandatory life imprisonment with mm -hmm. no chance of parole mm -hmm. just as easily. And um, I think you know that is really a magical thing when you can find common ground, reach across the aisle, mm -hmm. and get things done. Mm -hmm. Look, we're going to take a short break. In fact, I'll, I'll even throw this out there. Is that the, 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 the word deterrent is another issue, too, that comes into play mm -hmm. if you, in, well, in many ways and whatever. And so, uh, again, here we go again. 